Well, good Hello. evening, everyone. We are so excited to start our Welcome Book Club webinar. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. As we're starting about 15 minutes late, as you know, technical difficulties will arise from time to time. And our author, Sarah Casada, is with us, but she's with us from Guatemala. And we didn't even know that we'd have to hurdle things outside the country. So thank you for those of you who have stayed in with the webinar and are, are ready to go ahead and start. So I've got a couple of friends. I know that we're waiting for another person to join us, but we didn't want to delay any longer and we wanted to start our book club. My name is Michelle Warren and I am with Welcome and I am the host of today's webinar and just so privileged to be a part of the Welcome community. I'm getting to meet so many women from all across the country and even a couple of people outside of the country as we really work to make a welcoming and hospitable community for anyone who's, who would enter. So thank you for coming and joining our webinar today. Tonight, I'm gonna to just go ahead and jump right in and start with introductions. I wanna hold Sarah off just just a little bit longer as she's the author as well as our uh, one of our main leaders and champions here at Welcome. But I want to go ahead and introduce our friend Joanne. And Joanne, why don't you go ahead and tell us where you're from and maybe how you got connected with Welcome and, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Joanne Maldonado and I live in the small state of Delaware on the East Coast. Um, I found Welcome actually on Facebook um, as I was just kind of looking through different posts um, about immigration. My husband is actually a native of Mexico and last year we went through the process to get his green card. Um, so I'm very familiar with, you know, all the ins and outs of that. And in fact, as I read the book, I was very familiar with a lot of the things that Sarah had gone through. Um, as, as well as the gambit of emotions that are run <laughs> from all, all that that entails. Um, but anyway, I just, I was really excited to come across Welcome because I felt like an immediate connection um, with other women that had the same heart as I do for immigrants. And I was really pretty relieved to find that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful. Um, for you guys, and I'm grateful to be here. Well, we are grateful to have you be a part of this amazing, growing digital collective community. And I will say this, I hear that, I know Sarah would agree, we hear that a lot. It's just so fun, it's so great to have been able to find one another. Well, you know, anytime I've had a gathering with women and book clubs, people come along the way. And right now we have a friend, um, Aaron. Aaron, we're so glad that you're here with us tonight to enjoy our very first um, welcome webinar book discussion. So, you know, Joanne just shared a little bit about who she was, where she lived, and how she got connected to welcome. And we would love to hear from you. So tell us a little bit more about yourself, Aaron. Well, I live in Michigan. Um, I live in a suburb of Detroit. And until the last few months, I didn't really... Um, know much or have much of an interest in immigration, but because of all the, um, the issues with zero tolerance and the family mm -hmm. separation, you know, I can remember one Sunday just watching TV and searing, you know, about 2000 children being separated from their families. And, you know, just the Lord really stirred my heart and I just kept researching about it and trying to find, um, just sort of sorting through all the the craziness as to what was really going on. Um, and that's kind of how I found welcome. Just one day it actually um, just popped up on my Facebook feed and I was probably not until like the end of July. And I was so excited because I, um, it, it's, it, I, I just was like, wow, there's Christians that are, you know, interested in welcoming immigrants and making sure they're treated appropriately and that. So that's how I, that's how I found out. That's so yeah. great. That's yeah. so great. We don't think that anything just pops up on Facebook, right? Right, right. No, I know, I know. <laughs> that's, that's so great about the whole story is I know. God just has all these beautiful connections. We're so glad that you're a part yeah. of it. And, Thank you. And really, Sarah, we know that you know a lot about Welcome. You are one of our, yeah. our great community leaders. And, and so it's just really a privilege that you also wrote a book and that we get to have you yeah. share a little bit. So just go ahead and introduce yourself and you take over, take out, Take whatever you want to this time to take whatever you want to say, please. Thanks for joining us and tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, I'm so glad everybody's here. It's really fun to get to be together, meet some people that I've been talking with online and to be able to discuss the book. 
Um, my name is Sarah Casada, and in 2007, I guess, I met a really cute boy who ended <laughs> up um, turning my life in different directions in so many different ways. Um, one of the biggest for this conversation is around immigration. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I met my now husband, Billy, we were both living in Los Angeles and it was about on our third date that he let me know that his uh, immigration paperwork was out of status. And you know, I really had no idea what that meant. Um, I had grown up in East Tennessee, a daughter of a pastor, very evangelical, very Christian family and following the law was important to me, still is. And um, I knew nothing about immigration. And so my, my first, thought when he told me that was, if this relationship gets serious, you know, I hope he works that out. <laughs> and that was really kind of my framework for learning about immigration. And as I walked through that process with him, I learned so much more. And that's really what the book was born out of, um, was both our experience and then also um, I'm a researcher by nature, sociologist. And so I wanted to talk about how our story fit into the bigger picture of what's happening in the country at large. So it was a really fun experience to write and I'm really excited we get to talk about it. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Well, before I go into some of the other questions that we have and, you know, I really want this to feel more like a living room. And I was telling our participants, you know, Joanne, Aaron, and Sarah, that there's lots of room for interrupting. You know, it's not interrupting when you're in a living room <laughs> discussing a book, but I wanted to at least say that I got to meet Sarah, I think it was back in 2010, 11 timeframe. Um, and, you know, just have heard a little bit of her story along the way, but but for sure was just really excited when she asked me to endorse her book, Love Undocumented. And so, you know, I got to read one of the early copies and, you know, just sort of put a shout out for that for her. But anytime you endorse a book, you know, the actual physical copy comes to your house. And I pulled, I pulled it off my shelf because I thought, well, if I'm going to lead a book discussion, I should <laughs> remember it. I read it. I did read it, but it's been a while. So I did that and I found this card. I found this card that Sarah had sent to me um, thanking me for endorsing it. And I'm going to read a little snippet because, you know, this was before Welcome. And this was before, you know, a lot of our intersection with this digital community was going to happen. And so I'll just kind of um, go through. I won't read the whole letter, but I'll, it, she says she concludes with saying, I hope this book invites more people into the movement of welcome and hospitality. And thank you for your supporting it. And I just thought, and I sent it to her. I was like, Sarah, can you believe, you know, that's what you said back then, you know, when you were writing that book that your heart beats, you know, mm -hmm. for inviting people in and welcoming them and being hospitable. And that's what, you know, our digital platform is all about. So I thank you for your just consistent leadership and voice, but mm -hmm. let's dive into the book. I think I might have to go turn on a light here. We started, I'm in mountain standard time and I was in front of a window and it's starting to set. And so I'm starting to look. I'm looking around, it's getting very dark in here. So if I get up, that's what I'm doing. But just to say, why don't we go ahead and kick it off? Um, Joanne or Aaron, you know, what were some things that you read that that created some type of response? I mean, what made what did you what did you enjoy? Is there something you learned? Did you know that something you read make you think more deeply? You know, where you know, good books, you're laughing and crying. You know, where, what were some of your responses to this story? Well, I think, you know, when I first started reading it, I, I was last summer, so I was so um, just hungry for information because I was trying to figure out what was going on, and you know, because it's so much um, in the media is like left versus right and, and how the immigration issue has been, been looking at it, but I wanted to look at it from like, what, what is God's heart? So... Um, you know, I one of the I was kind of looking back over it this past week, and it said because of Sarah, there was one part in the first chapter where it said um, because of Sarah's neighbors, she experienced God in a different way, and it was more towards the beginning. Um, you know, and it made me really think is how um, just by experiencing different people and in, in different cultures um, can kind of and take off our American lens and we can just a different way. So that, that part really stood out to me, you know, mm -hmm. and how there was a part also that it said um, in the beginning too, I think 12% of Christians look at um, the Bible as a source for immigration. So to me, so I had appreciated so much the focus and kind of giving me a solid basis mm -hmm. to, to go okay. from. That's great. 
Yeah. Jo- Joanne, what were some of your thoughts? Well, um, as I said earlier, I, I related to a lot of the things that she spoke about as far as um, my firsthand experience with walking through immigration with my husband. But um, some of the things that were kind of new to me was the um, the three and 10 year bars. I hadn't heard of that. And I guess it was really just because we didn't have to deal with that because he hadn't left the country and come back. Um, so, and I don't know if you want to maybe explain that a little bit um, for anybody who hasn't read the book, Sarah, but that and the, uh, the bed quota I hadn't heard of. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was my education out of the book. Um, I mean, there were a lot of things that, you know, a lot of numbers, a lot of figures, a lot of data that I um, really appreciated in the book. It was extremely um, eye opening in a lot of ways. Um, Even though I have some experience, there were still a lot of things that I just went, wow, (laughs) about. Um, But the thing that I really appreciated about it was just the heart um, to, you know, love people regardless of, you know, where they're from, you know, the the backgrounds, the different cultures, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be that at the end of the day, you know, we are all made in the image of God and that we all have equal value. And um, if you don't mind, I would like to read just a little ex- excerpt here. We would welcome that. Okay. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, this, I actually read this to my husband last night because this was probably one of my favorite um, paragraphs in the book. Um, it's on page 130. It says, as we hear the stories of our brothers and sisters fleeing to the United States to escape military extremists, gang violence, or famine and starvation, we experience this suffering as a family. Those who have violated immigration laws to save their lives or the lives of their children make us, the church, a mixed status family. This solidarity birthed in the kinship of the kingdom makes it impossible to ignore the crushing edicts that harm our family. When we said yes to Jesus, we signed the form acknowledging our alien relatives. Mm -hmm. And I was just, that last um, Mm -hmm. line just really hit me. You know, I was like, amen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, and if you have other things to comment about, please do. You know, Sarah, I I do want you to explain the three and 10 year bars, you know, and if you want to weigh in on the bed quota, but I also, you know, writing a book is a very vulnerable and personal thing. You know, Mm -hmm. I I know from personal experience, you know, I put a lot of raw thoughts and feelings into my book Mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes you read it and it evokes, you know, emotions. And so I don't want you just to kind of listen to us talk about some of the emotion, Mm -hmm. but really just kind of walk us through some of what it was like, maybe some parts of your story that you wrote down that, you know, you were really excited because it brought so much joy or excitement to share others that might have been a little bit more hard to share. One of the things you write, once you write in a book, it's out there, you know, you can't pull it back and you are vulnerable, you know, so I would, I'd love to take some time to just listen to some of that as, you know, as the author. You know, it's interesting. I think some of it is probably a connects really well to the three and 10 year bars, because I don't know that I actually knew what those were when I was going through the process that I actually had to research for the book. And I was like, oh man, I don't think I knew that this was on the table. Um, So essentially the three and 10 year bars are, um, it's sort of, I guess in a reality, it's a punitive law that if you, um, if you were to marry a US citizen, and you try to apply for a green card through a marriage, if you entered the country illegally and have been here for a year or less, you may be asked to leave the country for three years and reapply. Um, If you've been here for more than a year, then you may be asked to leave for 10 years. And um, that pops up in our story a little bit because um, my husband had come to the country legally so technically, he did not um, qualify for to, for those bars. However, um, being the young 20-something dude that he was, he had lost some paperwork um, that was supposed to be kept with his passport. You know, when they say, like, keep these receipts for your records, um, he, he didn't do that. And so um, when we went to visit a lawyer, the lawyer said to us, 
the story your paperwork is telling is that you had a legal visa, but rather than use it, you entered the country illegally um, because you don't have this paper that was apparently supposed to be stapled here. And so our lawyer told us, and at this point in our story, we were um, engaged. And so the lawyer said to us, you know, you'll need to get married first and then probably move back to Guatemala, which is my husband's home country. And then you can apply from there and it can take anywhere between three months and 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that, what I didn't realize at that time was he was referring to the 10 year bar and someone just commented on the webinar that there's waivers that can lift those bars. And that's probably why he told us between three months and 10 years, because it's such a complicated, <laughs> nuanced system in so many ways that you can't give people a straight answer. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting there in that chair, and this was what was such a interesting part of the book to write, <clears throat> was this question of, did I really grapple with the decision I was mm -hmm. making? Um, <clears throat> and in some ways, the short answer to that is no, because I was in love with this person, and I was like, well, if we move to Guatemala, we move to Guatemala. I'm living in Guatemala right now, <laughs> which is <laughs> an aside, but, um, but we're doing that by choice and not by evacuation, which definitely feels different. Um, but at that point in our marriage and in our relation or our relationship, you know, there was this moment of, you know, I can still back out. We're just engaged. Um, and so as I was writing the book, I was trying to, you know, my 30 something self was trying to ask my 20 something self, what were you thinking? <laughs> like what was going through <laughs> your mind? <laughs> Um, and you know, I, I wrote in the book actually about Wonder Woman because that movie had just come out and she, you know, was trying to leave to go help save humanity. And I think it's her mother is like, you know, what will you, what might happen to you if you go? And she's like, what will happen to me if I stay? And that's how I look back on that experience. Like, what would it say about me? If I say that I love this person and I've already committed to marry them, and then this first hurdle, which granted was a was a big one, it would have been a, been a big adjustment for our life and the future that we planned together if we'd had to move for 10 years. But I was like, who would I be if I walked out in this moment? Um, mm -hmm. And so um, uh, someone just said she's waiting for her Guatemalan husband's appointment in Guatemala. So this it is it is a lot of people's stories and of people that go with their um, partner that's not from the U.S. and wait out that process in, in their home country. And, and there's all sorts of reasons people can or can't make that decision. But it's one of the big um, kind of unknown secrets of the immigration system that people think, oh, if you marry a U.S. citizen, it's automatic citizenship. Right. And that is just simply not the case. Um, there's lots, there's restrictions on that. And then there's also this element of it might, you might have to wait 10 years outside the country. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I certainly don't have to ask all the questions, um, really? but I'm curious, Aaron and Joanne, do you guys have questions that you want to ask Sarah? Hmm. Or even comments. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything. It's just how often do you get the author of a book? I know. <laughs> I know. Like oh, we didn't you? mention the bed quota. If we want to, oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. She yeah. brought that up a little bit as well. Especially um, for now. It absolutely is. So the bed quota is kind of a um, casual term, I guess, that refers to the fact that ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, has a a nightly minimum to keep mm -hmm. thirty four thousand people detained. And so that is something that is mandated by Congress, which they are the only law enforcement agency to have a, a mandate for how many people they must keep detained at all times. Um, and some of that has to do with the privatization of immigration detention and the contracts that they negotiate with the government that um, mean they, they get a minimum nightly payment as well from our tax dollars. And so, yeah. um, it's definitely a very complicated and multifaceted system, the way that we right. deal with um, law enforcement in general in the country, but around detention in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm going to say Sierra. That's all is that, good, no? Is that people that like, were arrested at the, could be anybody, people that were arrested at the border, or just people that ICE picked up 
for being here unauthorized or just any situation of holding people? I think it's any situation where they're detaining okay. immigrants. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, we, we haven't had so much trouble meeting those kind of quotas. Unfortunately. You know, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Joanne, were you going to make the comment, ask a question, say anything? Um, I just wanted to um, say that I appreciate the fact that we have um, resources such as Sarah's book because I feel like um, with the political agendas that we yeah. have these days, um, there's definitely a lot of information that's put out there that is tainted a certain way or maybe yes. leans one way or another. Um, depending on what side of the fence you're on. And mm -hmm. I just, I always try to really encourage people to do their own research. Yep. I encourage people to never believe anything they see or yeah. hear <laughs> these days. <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, I, I send them to the website, you know, that covers mm -hmm. all of our immigration laws and policies um, because even just spending 10 minutes, you know, yeah. doing a couple searches on that yeah. um, is very helpful and just, you know, very informative. And of course it comes from the source. So you don't have to worry about, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. somebody having an agenda in what's, what's being looked at or what's being said. Um, yeah. But I appreciate that yeah. you did a lot of really hard work and great research yeah. um, in this book. And it's, it's very helpful. And I can't wait to give it to someone else, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to um, share that information. So yeah. thank you, Sarah. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. It was interesting for me in the process, because like I said, you know, I really started from a place of personal experience. Yeah. And then I was filling in the gaps and, and even understanding what exactly had happened <laughs> as I did the research. Um, but you know, I was writing this book um, in the summer of 2017, okay. and um, that was right after the 2016 election where immigration had been a huge mm -hmm. topic, um, and then uh, the inauguration in 2017. And, you know, I was hearing lots of headlines talking about, um, you know, immigrants don't pay taxes and they're taking right. from our system and different things. And meanwhile, I was literally reading actuarial notes from the social security administration, mm -hmm. which I do, do not recommend <laughs> <It's> incredibly <laughs> boring. Um, but it was fascinating to read yeah. from some of these actual government agencies that were saying this is, and I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it was in the billions of net profit mm -hmm. that was, that's in those systems from undocumented populations in the U S and how, mm -hmm in actuality, they're relying on some of that income to pay out social security. And so it was a very different story. And there's, people can get certain data and skew it a certain way, but when you really kind of dive into the details, it paints a much broader picture, a much more complex picture. Right, no, that makes sense. You know, I think one of the, the gifts of your, the way you wrote the book is it's disarming. You know, I agree with you, Joanne, it's good to get to the source, but Sarah, you're right. People don't want to read actuarial data and who can blame them, right? You know, it's just like, I just want good information. I just want good information. But some people are just like, you know, I just want to be really close to the story of it. And so I think just that, I remember when I read it, it was like this weaving of like at this triad of personal story, which everybody wants to read a good story. And Sarah, you have a good story. And it seems like even from our live comments, there are a lot of you who have had similar stories mm -hmm. that are walking through that. And so, you know, they're hard stories, but they're, they're rich stories. When I say good, I mean rich. Um, they're rich stories. And then just as a Christian, it's so imperative that we look at this. You know, Aaron, you said, you right. know, and it's a, this percentage, this small microscopic percentage, 12% like of Christians. You think the Bible might have something to do with immigration, the rest of it. You know, they just don't even, 88% of our, our churches are just not even consulting the scripture. And so for for just your voice, Sarah, to really be weaving yeah. God's heart and his word and his call to the church all throughout it. That's a beautiful element as well. And like that three-legged spool triad, you know, just adding the yeah. really important, good information. You know, there's actually 
psychological testing, like the way the brain works, they, you know, you've got your amygdala, which is the back of the brain. And when you hear something or you see something that makes you afraid, it's that fight and flight. And so, you know, it's not, it's no wonder, you know, you, as you talk about 2017, there's just a lot of fear. There's fear now, you know, and the amygdala just gets all stirred up. And the only way to calm down the amygdala is to have good executive function in the front of the brain. So all of that scary stuff, when you, when you put it through the executive function, that's the only thing that can calm it down. And so just, you know, good stories are important. They're rich. They help us realize the humanity of it. As a Christian, you know, the Bible is so important to help calm us down like that's right god's called me to be of you know of a world that is not here that our citizenship is in heaven mm -hmm. help me to learn lord but then you know i can look at this as an american there's really good information and i need to know it you know as a u.s citizen that immigration as a christian mm -hmm. is important but so as an american and so having that book and books like that to really help our executive function process mm -hmm. that we may be hearing that might result in some panic i just think it's a really great addition um to good information out there so i'm grateful um but yeah any other um i see that somebody said the same thing it said sarah wove together history statistics yeah. references, her personal story and the story of others in the most beautiful way and so we're and we want this message to reach other people erin or or Jane, do you have any thoughts maybe about just some of the things that we've been talking about um yeah i think um you know in looking at the i think looking at them as people, you know, I think a lot of the current rhetoric is, you know, calling people aliens and illegals and that, um, they're really, they're people. Um, you know, when this first started and I, I wanted to, you know, when I knew the family separation was happening, um, you know, I thought I'm in Michigan, I'm not going to have any chances I, to, you know, I'm not down at the border, but, I think people, I, I real there's people in my area that came through zero tolerance and the separation, and I've been volunteering with a group to help them. And I just remember when I first met one of the ladies, it's like, oh my gosh, that that is a real person that happened mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and they are people, you know. And and my take is, you know, no matter how they come across for whatever reason, is just treating them with dignity, mm -hmm. um, you know, and. I don't, don't think that is happening, but um, it's my heart that that to, to, to at least keep advocating for that to happen because they are real people. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that um, one of the things that um, keeps people from from connecting is that they a lot of times they really don't have anyone right. in their their immediate world, you know, in their jobs or their churches or their, you right. know, in their neighborhoods. Um, so they don't relate. They don't have that connection. They don't, you know, they don't have the exposure to somebody else's life that has gone right. through some of these things. And that's unfortunate, yeah. you know, because it really allows people to be removed from it. And then it's easy for them when they hear things that are derogatory or whatever, you know, they don't really know, they don't have anything to base a different opinion on to resist that. So um, I just, you know, that's one of the things that I ask people often, you know, how many um, people are in your life? How many connections do you have with someone that isn't from here? Right. And, um, you know, <laughs> A lot of times, you know, they might say, oh, well, you know, I work with a guy or I, mm -hmm. you know, this or that. And I'm kind of like, okay, well, have you, how much time have you spent with this person, you know, really connecting and talking about their life and the things that they've been through or the way they see the world, you know, and a lot of times, of course, it's, you know, they really haven't. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I always try to encourage people. I mean, it's, it's hard to just throw yourself into another culture as you mm -hmm. know Sarah was saying in the book as she when she moved and she was she found herself kind of in the yeah. middle of this Hispanic <laughs> um, culture and you know not really knowing the language and things like that but at the mm -hmm. same time I thought that was great because she could really relate to how they feel when they come here mm -hmm. um, so it's just I don't know I I just try to encourage people to mm -hmm. volunteer or, you know, find mm -hmm. a way to kind of connect with the community. Mm -hmm. 
there's always something, you know, where if, if you have a community that does, you know, festivals or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you can somehow try to connect, you can give out water on a hot day, you can, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There are ways of, of connecting if you really want to do it. Yeah, those are such mm -hmm. good ideas. You know, I think there's a statistic that, you know, the same um, poll that found that only 12% of evangelicals mm -hmm. look at the issue of immigration through something other than the Bible, is that only 10%, around 10% of evangelical churches have any type of outreach to immigrants. And so I think, you know, the, the reality is, is when we're not in relationship with people, it's mm -hmm. really hard to see humanity and I, and to also have a sense of urgency. And I, and that's why it's so important to have books, right? Books bring us into worlds all mm -hmm. over from the beginning time we're children, you know, all the way until, you know, when I guess we stop reading, but it helps us even if we don't have those direct relationships to be inspired. And I think Sarah, you did a really great job. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, around, I guess it was the chapter garment of destiny. You know, you talk a lot about relationships and urgency in, you know, pages 90 and 91. And I guess I could read a little bit. You know, you said important issues affecting vulnerable people mm -hmm. are still largely being ignored. But the line right. between engaging and, dis and dismissing injustice feels blurrier. I believe mm -hmm. in our world of social media push notifications in the 24-hour news cycle, many of us are bombarded by the heartbreak of the day as passions for worldwide injustices swell and recede online. And you just continue to go on, but you talk about, it says, it, you said relationships are key for sustaining this kind of work long-term. When we are in relationship with those most affected by the news, we cannot escape the real consequences of executive orders, Supreme Court rulings, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to weigh in a little bit? I would love to hear, you know, you can obviously quote your book, but I mean, even from just your heart, you know, what are you, what were you trying to share as far as response to Christians and to people um, engaging the pain that we see, you know, on the news and maybe aren't directly connected with personally like you and some of you and the other people who are watching the webinar? You know, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen a little bit in the last couple of years is people who maybe thought they weren't connected to any undocumented immigrants mm -hmm. who have seen as the um, zero tolerance and some of these other policies right. have taken to effect that, oh, I didn't realize that my son's classmate's mm -hmm. family was undocumented or different things mm -hmm. and how that's opening people's eyes that this um, caricature of an undocumented immigrant that maybe they've seen on the news is very different right. than the real flesh and blood person right. who's been eating at their table and playing in their backyard and jumping on the trampoline. Um, and so I think that will continue to, um, mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that relationships change our, our worldview much more quickly and much more deeply than, um, you know, memes or <laughs> headlines mm -hmm. or some of those things. Um, but, you know, it was very interesting to me several years um, after Billy and I had been married, maybe five years, we, we led a workshop um, at a conference on um, intercultural marriage. And it was super fun. And one of the things that we talked about was immigration status and how mm -hmm. because because we were married from these different backgrounds that opened our eyes to this topic that neither of us really knew much about. Yeah. And I remember a participant raising her hand and for some reason feeling the need to tell me that um, now that our immigration process had been resolved, that we would no longer think about it anymore. Hmm. And it was very startling to me and it was I'd probably a really good, she wasn't um, critiquing me. She was just saying, well, you know, you're talking about that now, but you'll move on. And I remember thinking, I don't want to, because it was such an emotional experience. And it was such a visceral experience. And I think for me, as someone who grew up taking my faith very seriously and mm -hmm. deeply wanting to follow God's leading and call in the world around me, you know, I felt like, no, this was a faith shaping experience for me. And I want to continue advocating because when we were walking through it, I couldn't say much about it. Um, you know, in the same way that some of these people right. are discovering that folks in their life are undocumented, 
you know, we weren't really talking about it very openly when we were going through it because you can't. And so um, I think that it's. Oh, I think we might have lost Sarah. I hope she comes back soon. Yeah. All right. We'll give her another minute. But, you know, coming in from Guatemala does have its little hiccup. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Sarah, if you jump in, please cut me off. But, you know, I think this is a good segue um, into yeah. just really looking at some of the takeaways um, that we that we have from the book or that maybe you have from the book um, that how other women should think more deeply about mm-hmm. Um, what we are experiencing. There's been a lot in this particular, I wonder how many book groups, right? Usually have such a dynamic thing happening, you know, at our borders and just that keeps coming up in in our time because it's very real. This is not some static book that's dusty, that's not relevant already, or even just a love story that we get to enjoy. I mean, this is provocative, you Mm -hmm. know, because today and yesterday and probably tomorrow, we're going to have multiple news sources talking about this. And so, you know, what do you think we as women should do, can do um, regarding just using books like this and and even small book groups or just this conversation? How do we steward it, you know, in the church and right now in our country? The last thing people want to be accused of is being political or divisive, right? And that's And nobody wants that. We already have plenty of that, right? Right. So so how do we become, you know, hospitable and welcoming in, uh, it's not even just immigrants, but to people who look just like us, who may not have those same experiences? How do we build bridges? You know, so I'm just curious, what what do you ladies think? And frankly, friends, it's wonderful to read all your comments. If you have questions, go ahead and put them out. We want to read them and we'll we'll just bring them to the group. Well, I think, you know, a lot is... like we said a little while ago, it's just getting, I'm sure there's immigrants everywhere, you know? Um, and I think especially because of the, the zero tolerance and the family separation there, there's, um, still a lot going on when people are released from detention and that. So I, I'd venture to say, even in the Midwest, I mean, I know of a lot of situations, um, and, there's so many opportunities just to come alongside vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Um, I know the people that I've been working with and it's, it's leveled off now, but in the beginning when they were first, um, the group I've been working with was started because um, Bethany Christian in Grand Rapids, Michigan had Mm -hmm. about 50 foster kids. So some of the, uh, the kids that were separated were sent up here and put into foster care. So, um, basically a long story short is I, I just know of situations where there are different people in communities and they, they're vulnerable. They, you know, when they're, especially when they're first out of detention. Um, what I've been trying to do is even just explaining to people, well, this is what I've experienced and you can't really, I've seen so many times and I've been, you know, at times guilty of getting drawn into debating about it, but no one can debate your own experience. That's right. So what I've been saying is, well, this is what I experienced um, in that. And so that's kind of what I've been trying to do and just gearing it towards like, okay, well, maybe this is what the Bible says about, you know, vulnerable and this and that. And that I think you can't go wrong with doing mm-hmm. that. True. Or <laughs> hopefully that will help. Yeah. Well, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes, I mean, I just love how the Holy Spirit really provoked you to get more involved. I love just hearing your story, (laughs) Erin. And I think it's beautiful. No, I think it's beautiful. Uh, There's, I think you would probably find a lot of camaraderie with people because that may be some of their story too. What I love about this book club is I'm finding all these women who have had, you know, Joanne yourself. I mean, I don't know how you all are feeling, but I'm just like, this is real. I know. Um, But there are a lot of people who don't who aren't moving in that way. And so right. I know for me, just in my personal, I mean, the way I got involved was through relationships as well and just being yeah. proximate to immigrants and taking that that step and bringing what I knew, not just my own personal story, but what I knew to other people and just to really lean into it. And, you know, those are some of the questions I think we need to ask ourselves. How do we steward what we see and what we know? Mm-hmm. You know I think it's great because we may not all be making that step to serve, but yeah. those of us who are serving and having our mm-hmm. eyes open in a deeper mm-hmm. way, we still can steward that experience, right? Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. all of us are going to have Sarah or Joanne or Kelly or some of our other friends' experiences. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I can steward that story and I can steward my own story 
Mm -hmm. um, to the people that I know. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts, Joanne? Yeah, that's definitely true. I, I think that um, one of the things that I have really been stretched with, um, I want to say probably since the 2016 election and mm -hmm. just the, um, I, I'm just going to call it like it is, the division that has yeah. come about, um, especially on social media. I, you know, it's really easy to look at what mm -hmm. somebody says and, and immediately feel some kind of offense, especially mm -hmm. if what they're saying is, you know, directed to a, a people group that you mm -hmm. actually have relationship with or that you love or that you're married into or whatever it may be. Um, but what I have learned is that, and, and this has just been, you know, mm -hmm. God showing me um, different things, but every person, you know, thinks what they think because of the situations in their world. You know, they make decisions based on, you know, what is best for their family, what is best for mm -hmm. their future, what is best, mm -hmm. you know, for, um, for them in general. And, you know, we all do that. And so what we have to remember is that, you know, we can give people the benefit of the doubt that they have a brain and that they've thought things through. Um, and we don't have to disrespect them or dishonor mm -hmm. them in order to disagree with them. That's right. um, so I just have learned that listening is always the first thing that I need to mm -hmm. do. And then once I've really heard their heart mm -hmm. on something, now not only do I know like how to approach them about you know, what, what I would like to share, but I also know where they're coming from and I see why they think the way they think. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's really important that we um, remember mm -hmm. that as we would like other people to, uh, you know, to honor mm -hmm. and respect these vulnerable people that we're, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to, um, to really kind of stand in the gap for, we have to remember that the people that are kind of coming against them are also people too. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know? So um, I just think that, like I said, it, it's all really a heart issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it trust me when I say in the very beginning, you know, I was ready to like, come out swinging <laughs> with some me of too. the things that were, yeah. you know, said sure. or acute sure. accusations that were made, um, just derogatory things. But again, you know, people have their own experiences, like you said, and, and people yeah. cannot, you can't take a person's experience from right. them. And you don't know, like maybe that the only experience those that person has had with a people group has been negative, right? You know, you really don't know until you have that conversation or right. dig a little deeper. So well, I think, I think there's so many people that would love to, to be a part, you know, to receive that kind of grace to be listened to and right. until we're willing to lead on that, you know, that is not a narrative we hear anymore. Right. Just like yeah. I, you know, it's sort of my ideas are my ideas. And if you don't mm -hmm. agree with me, you can go somewhere else. And, yeah. you know, that is, that's not going to get us anywhere, you know, and no. I, I, I'm sad. Sorry, Sarah's not here, but I, I do know that that was, it, it took mm -hmm. a lot of courage for her to write her story. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of that. Yeah. And, you know, the, some of the, personal backlash, but even just the personal walking through, you know, I'm just really grateful. I'm grateful for her. I'm grateful for her message. And I'm, and I'm grateful for, you know, other resources that are out there, but if we don't lead and share those resources and we don't, you know, steward, like I said, what we, what we know and what we see, then we're limiting the opportunity to build the bridges that we so desperately, not mm -hmm. only need, we don't just need them, but we want them. It's not like medicine where I'm going to take my, you know, painful pill because I need it, but I don't want it. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I, I need it and I want it. I long to feel that confluence of you know a confluence is when two streams mm -hmm. intersect right and just the rush of water mm -hmm. it's beautiful white right water is yeah. life -giving. and and so to have two divergent ideas to come yeah. the richness that can come literally from like you said joanne listening yeah. i want people to love my immigrant neighbors i want them to hear my story but if i'm yeah. not willing to give the same grace to say you know what I want to love you and I want to love people who think like you, even if it's not the same way. And I want to hear your stories and I want to take time. You know, it just takes, it takes a lot of discipline 
and practicing things that should feel natural as a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. But because of humanity and because of, you know, just our humanness rather, and because of the culture that seems to want to feed into it's okay to be Mm -hmm. at opposite ends, you know, that we have to literally, you know, resist that and, and, and practice basically godly behavior. Um, but really we have to practice it, um, because it is, mm-hmm. it is a foreign light in our current darkness. We'll say it that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, we are coming right up on the hour and I'm just so sad. So, so let's just, <laughs> I've, you know, we're women. I've been in, in living rooms with women plenty of times and people have to leave because their kids are crying and going home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like get home. They're just threw up all over the carpet, you know, those kinds of things. So I'm yeah. just going to pretend that's what happened. That you know, <laughs> it wasn't technical difficulties that four women and other friends came together and one of them just had to leave because of an emergency, <laughs> you know, so we'll, yeah. we'll go ahead and, and, and begin to end. But I just, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. For, the, for joining us, Aaron and Joanne. Oh, you're welcome. And I really just pray that God will continue to give you opportunity. He has obviously fueled, you know, information and passion in both of you and just being leaders in Michigan and in Delaware. I mean, the world would be a different place if women all over the country, you know, were really be willing to continue to, to push in and practice new things. And then just our friends, Kelly and, and Brittany and, and others, thank you for sharing a little bit of just even, and Anne, just some of your comments, you know, while we've had this, this webinar yeah. and just want to encourage people to continue to bring that message. You know, people were asking where to get the book. The good news is Amazon is around and you can get <laughs> anything on Amazon yeah. put in love undocumented yeah. Amazon, and you'll get that link. And, you know, we have a study, we have a study guide. So a reading guide. So if anybody wants to do a love undocumented yeah. book club, I mean, let us know, send us some pictures. You know, I want to see women around the country grabbing a cup of coffee, sitting around under blankets, or I guess the spring and warm is coming, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just that warm, yeah. cozy feeling of women who may or may not know each other, um, just trying to experience each other and each other's stories and also Sarah's story and really allow her experience and her research and her heart as, as even a pastor to, to really influence us and move us. So I think think, even though Sarah's not here, I believe that if we stop our cameras, we will be done. Um, So thank you everybody for joining us for this evening and please share our webinar. This is going to sit on our Facebook page and and share it so that people can enjoy just some of the rich dialogue that we've been a part of. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. you. And good night. Good night.